Hello and welcome to B2B Revenue Leaders. I'm your host, Dustin Tizik. This podcast, as always, is brought to you by Testimonial Hero. To learn more, head on over to testimonialhero.com. And on this episode, I'm chatting with Roger Martin, who is the co-founder and CEO of Thrive More Brands. And we chat about how important tonality is to sales and why it really separates the top 5% of salespeople from the rest. We talk about how to effectively practice your tonality and how a good salesperson persuades but never manipulates. And then finally, we wrap it up by talking about what it was like for him to switch over to being an entrepreneur after 25 years in the corporate world. On to the episode. Hey, Roger, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to be here, Dustin. Yeah, glad to have you here. We're going to talk about a lot of sales related things, but particularly around tonality, which as someone who's managed sales teams, both of us have, obviously, yeah. it's one of the hardest things to teach because as we mentioned off air, people don't hear their tone all the time. Yeah. So I wanted to get your thoughts there. Maybe broadly speaking, why you feel tonality is maybe underappreciated and how it separates people into that kind of top tier of salespeople. Yeah, for sure. It's something I'm really passionate about and I've written about given talks from stage about this because it is an underappreciated and incredibly important skill set. I really believe that tonality, pauses and silence yep. separate the killers and the people that are making most of the money in any any field in sales and those that you know just earn a living. And the reason I say that is because everyone knows this, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. But for some reason, salespeople forget that and think, I have these 17 slides I'm going to get through regardless. Yeah. I have these key features of my product that I am hell or high water going to talk about. And you know, I'm, then I'm going to close at the end versus having a conversation like you would with a, a friend or a, you know, a real human being uh, over a glass of wine or something where, you know, if they said, yeah, you know, I'm really struggling at work right now, you wouldn't say, well, what is your biggest problem at work? What do you, you would lean in and say, Dustin, what, what's going on? Tell me about that. Yeah. You know, you would just lower your voice, you would slow your pace, and you would use a concerned tone because that's what a real human being would do with another real human being. <laughs> but salespeople, for some reason, they forget that. And that, that could be nerves, that could be bad habits, that could be poor coaching from their leader. But boy, you know, and the same thing would go for those pauses. Dustin, if if I were to ask what your number one goal of your podcast would be, what what would you say that is? Like those pauses, you're waiting for me to finish my sentence and you are listening. Yeah. So no matter what happening, you know, you got in a fight with your significant other that morning or stuck in traffic, like all that stuff kind of goes away in the meeting when you get slower and quieter because people, that, that's mm -hmm. just our nature. We have to have a completion. That's, you know, we need a beginning, middle, end and, and everything in our life. And salespeople talk too loud, way too fast, and they don't actively listen. And that's a, gen, that's a sweeping generalization, but the vast majority, and I've, I've managed teams as big as 500 sales representatives. These were professional sales representatives. I, I've led small teams of 10 reps and you know, everything in between business to business, business to consumer, you know, we're in the franchising business now. So business to another business owner, to another, you know, to a consumer. So all of that, and it really doesn't change. It really doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like the, I probably can't see behind me because the blurry background, but yeah. I have a book back there. Never split the difference. Chris Voss book. I think he calls it like late night talk show voice or late night radio, radio, radio voice. voice. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. That's the one. So yeah, similar thing. And I think you mentioned managing larger teams. To me, this is one of the harder things to scale mm -hmm. because as you grow your team, everything becomes like operationalized and productized and here's your script, read the script. You're going to get judged on the script. Whereas tonality can fall by the wayside because someone like you leading 200, 500 person team, you can't listen to every sales call. Like it's just sure. not feasible. So how, how have you worked to kind of scale that with your teams? Mm. Yes. And I'm, I would say I'm even at a morbid disadvantage as a franchisor because I can't fire a franchisee, right? I can't fight. You know, like yeah. this is a yeah. long-term business agreement. So we, we, you know, there's not really a ton of performance management you can do. There's coaching and you know, they got to be compliant and whatnot. But so you, you really have to make the journey there. I found I have to make the journey theirs. And Dustin, it is something we go back to again and again and again and again and again. Every month we have a, a franchisee call and I talk about this again. I just, we just had a convention in a national convention in, in, uh, uh, Nashville with all of our franchisees. I gave this talk three times in three different breakout sessions uh, because I wanted to make sure there was a smaller audience and I could get to, you know, get eye contact and all that. 
I know this sounds cliche, but it is training, training, and then more training and more reinforcement. We, we need to be reminded more than we need to be taught. And you can teach people, but you need to remind them of, of why they should do that again and again and again. And to your point, some people may never get it. Like, and that they're probably not the right fit on your team if you want a, a, you know, a player top performing team. Because when people do understand the power of silence and tonality and they're modulating their voice and they're really connecting, they'll start making, they'll start closing sales without asking. The, the, the client will say, all right, what's the next step? You know, yeah. you don't have to ask that. Yeah, I think especially in the franchise space, because I mean, you'll get multi-unit operators who they do this professionally. It's all they do. Mm -hmm. Then you get the ones who it's just some guy who bought a juice franchise, for example, yep. right? Yep. And I'm curious then is, is that blank slate, you know, person who first time doing this, not much of a background in sales, is that easier to train or someone who, you know, comes from a world where they had sales training and did Sandler and, you know, all that sort of stuff. I, I'm going back and forth in my head of like, which one's actually better yeah. to start with? I would take a salesperson every day of the week because a salesperson, if they've been in sales, they believe in the you know, I, 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 eat, I eat what I kill, you know, that's even if they're on a yeah. salary, but, but, but the mentality that drives people into sales is I want to compete. Um, I want to win and I want to be able to measure my success. If somebody is not comfortable with that arrangement, they're, they're not going to be a great salesperson usually. And, and they're probably not going to be a great business owner because if you're not selling your product to your customers, you're, you're selling the vision, the dream work ethic, the stuff that needs to get done, the extra discretionary effort, you're selling that to your team. And so you're, you're always in sales. Everybody's in sales. People don't want to admit that, or they've had a bad experience with a salesperson because there's a lot of poor, you know, conduct by historically by some salespeople in some industries. And so they, they, you know, they align that in their mind with all salespeople, but sales should, you know, it, to the definition of sales in the dictionary, I wish just had one word and help, right? Sales is yeah. help. And we're not trying to get people to buy something they don't want, they don't need, but we are trying to help them uncover on their own, the pain points they have, the frustrations they have, because people only make a buying decision if they're in growth or trouble. If somebody is absolutely content, things are going great. Their business is growing. There's not a pain point. Good luck getting somebody to make a, a change, especially like an enterprise software change. Like that's, it's just not going to happen. It's when they're in growth mode and their current solution won't be able to support their future growth. And they know that they've identified that or they're in trouble, they're in pain. And usually we all know that, you know, pain is easier to sell into than growth, but, and you just approach it slightly differently. But the whole goal is to get them to understand and admit and talk openly about their pain and what happens if they don't solve that pain point. And if they don't switch their, their software solution or whatever the product or services that, that we're representing and then you help them make the decision that helps them solve that, which usually if you've done your job right is your product or service, but it may not be, you know, there's, mm -hmm. I think the best salespeople are like, we can't help you. This isn't, I was just kind of funny. One of our, our franchises is a, a light infrared sauna and light therapy studio. So people go in there for self-care for sauna, lose weight, improve their skin condition. And I'm working with a light manufacturer like a you know a fda approved light manufacturer for a proprietary type of light bed we want to have and i had the founder the ceo the cfo and the head engineer and somebody else and the head of sales on this call this morning and i just looked at him i said please tell me if you can't help me do this just tell me and that's totally cool yeah. high five we, we we you know but I, please don't tell me it's on your roadmap <laughs> or that, you know, we're, we're working on this because I know how that story ends. I've been down that road too many times and, and I, I, I would have so much respect. You know, we just started this relationship, but I will have so much respect for them either way. If they come back and they can help me, great, we're in business together. But if they say we can't or not at your price point or whatever, because it's a new, new technology, totally cool because mm -hmm. that's what sales is about. Like you, you can't help me, so we can't do a deal. But in the future, you know, the first person I'm going to call is you guys because you were you were straight, you know, honest with me. So for what that's worth. Yeah. No, I've had, like, I came up in sales, went to marketing, now do marketing and sales. And the amount of times I've told someone, like, listen, we're probably too expensive. This is probably a better solution. Go talk to them. I can do an intro. And then they go to a bigger company and they come back right to me, right? Like, yep. it pays off down the road. And I want to focus a little bit on something you mentioned on kind of the perception of sales from both ends. Like, I'm yeah. a sales rep. I need to 
manipulate whatever word you want to use to change this person. And on the other end from the buyer, oh man, it's a salesperson. This is like a head to head thing. And I think the key is making that flip to like, no, we're on the same side of the table. We're working collaboratively. And the fast talking sales guy with that tone is never going to be able to do that. I don't think there's no trust. You know, people, yeah. you know, we all always hear this, you know, people have to know, like, and trust you before they'll buy from you. I would argue that really they just have to trust that you can help them. If they believe mm-hmm. you that you can actually help them and they trust that you can help them, they don't even have to like you because they know that you'll give them the solution. Yeah. Hopefully they like you, but you know, they don't have to. And yeah, there's just that, that fast talking is usually a lack of self-confidence. Maybe they're, you said script earlier. I'm a huge proponent of script adherence because if we don't adhere to a script or a framework, at least mm-hmm. we don't know what to adjust or tweak as, as leaders and as, as the marketing and, and, and sales leaders that need to change that to optimize it. And so if you don't have script adherence, you really have no idea. You're just stabbing in the dark, hoping you get it right when you make changes. I'm talking about script adherence or a framework at least, but definitely you have to be able to go with the flow and, but, you know, like Jordan Belfort, you know, the straight line sales system, you, you want to keep driving people towards a decision. Yes or no. Both are, mm-hmm. both are fine. And if you go into it that, and I know it's hard because we're salespeople, we get paid for selling something and we don't get paid if we don't, but you almost have to disassociate yourself with the outcome, remain incredibly professional, really seeking to understand before being understood. And it's, you know, it's like, what do you, what is that? The manifestation, it just starts to happen because they, they being the prospect, they can smell it when you're desperate, when you're, when you're trying to hit that quota, they know it. Like people aren't yeah. stupid. They know it. And so that, that, that more disassociated, Hey, here's what we're going to do today. Here's what I'd like to cover. What would you like to cover? Cool. If at the end this makes sense, we'll talk about going to the next step. Fair enough. Yeah. Now their, 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 their resistance comes down Their their wall comes mm-hmm. down, but I think so many salespeople, and I deal with this a lot, uh, they're, they're trying to command the conversation and you want to direct it. And you said a word that it's funny. It's like a red flag for me because I've heard this, you know, manipulate, you know, manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I kick off our training, we have these things called training camps when all the new franchisees come in when they're getting ready to open their stores. And I tell them, you know, we're really good at sales and marketing and we're really good at, at training. That's what a franchisor is. You need to be really, really good at sales and the definition and persuasion influence. And you can see when I say, you know, I'm going to teach you how to persuade and influence people or, or my team. I, I will say that that my team does a lot of the training. I can see the reaction, you know, cause I'm looking at all the people and you know, I get room at 25 and you can see when you say, you know, I'm going to teach you how to persuade and influence people. They're like, Oh, you know, that yeah. they're, they, they, because they equate it with the manipulation. And so I quickly follow up and say, and by the way, manipulation is completely different from persuasion influence manipulation. I'm trying to get Dustin to do something that probably is not good for him, but is good for me. So I have to manipulate Mm -hmm. him and trick him into doing this. Persuasion influence is I'm going to persuade and influence your thinking to make the right decision for you. And if you're a professional, you would not ask somebody to make a decision for themselves that is not in their best interest. Manipulation is completely unidirectional, one-sided and wrong persuasion influence is how the world goes around and Mm -hmm. and those skill if you can persuade an influence and you can lead you can write your own ticket you can write your own ticket yeah and it goes back to like you said helping like if you're if you're trying to manipulate them and do something they don't want that's kind of the antithesis of helping right and i I like the point you made josh braun who talks a lot in the b2b space he calls it commission breath like you can you can smell it right when some you car salesmen they're showing you this garbage car they know you don't want it but you know they get a cut of it. So yep. like I think you have to be careful for that. And then one thing I kind of wanted to dive into a little bit is we talked about it a bit, is you know, there's scripting, there's role playing. And I feel like tonality is something role playing helps, but it's also a practice get the reps in thing as well. And it's really easy to default back to what you've always been doing. It's really yep. hard to practice the new thing you suck at. Like in yes. anything, a sport, exercising, whatever. So I'm curious how you help people kind of get the mindset, I guess, to actually work at the hard thing and do it repeatedly? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up because I we, we say it literally, it's a phrase, we have to have a culture of role play. Our, our company has a culture of role play. Your studio, be it a rock box or, or beam light sauna, your yeah. studio has to have a culture of role play. And the, the reason why, if you think about, you know, Tiger Woods, LeBron James, 
you know, when Kobe was at his at his best, they would lose a game and or lose a round and go right back to the practice range or to to the court and start shooting free throws and 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 working on what they missed because they practice. The best athlete, the most elite point zero 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 one percent athletes in the world, they practice all mm-hmm. the time. And for some reason, with salespeople, we think, okay, I've learned the script. I've gotten good at this. So now I go out on my four sales calls today or my six or eight sales calls and I'll just go through my thing. And then tomorrow I'll wake up and I'll do the same thing versus, hey, why don't I record myself role playing, you know, get with yeah. one of my colleagues and record myself. Everybody's got an iPhone. So no one has an excuse now. Everybody's got a voice recorder on their on their smartphone. They also have a video recorder, which would be even more powerful to video yourself because you'll see how you use your hands. You'll see and and physically watch the tonality either happen or not happen and how the person reacts to it. That is just how you get better at your job. And for some reason, it's accepted in sports, it's mandated in sports, it's accepted Mm -hmm. in music, it's accepted in acting. You know, they practice, they, they, they do roll run throughs of the script, but in sales, for some reason in business, we don't think about practice and the best salespeople practice. And they practice some more and they practice again. They don't do it until they can get it right. They do it until they can't get it wrong, which is a big difference. Yeah, it's it's funny. I actually had someone probably a couple months back, two guys from the practice lab, and that's their whole thing is practice sales like an athlete, like a uh, basketball player. They wouldn't just scrimmage all the time, right? They would take the time to break down their shot, their crossover. It's the same thing in sales, like a very specific, like a broad role play probably not the best focus on like specific parts as well and then get good at them. So I thought that was kind of an interesting parallel that most people can kind of relate to out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, we're all me included are guilty of that front to end role play, which is important, but not nearly as important as what you just said. Where are you struggling with? Let's just practice that. Let's go through that 17 times right now. Uh, Because then when you're in the moment, the game films playing in your head, you know, you know how to overcome this objection. You know how to, and I would argue most objections, the best salespeople get the few, like everything's, oh, the best salespeople, you know, have these great one-liners to overcome objections. <laughs> the best salespeople don't get objections because they, yeah. they know what's coming and they handle that and they, they price anchor, they third-party reference, they do all that during their presentation. So at the mm-hmm. end, it's like, all right, what, what are the next steps then? Where do we go from here? Uh, when you're getting a lot of objections, you're probably not using tonality. You're certainly not listening and you haven't practiced. Like that's, Objection should be the the watermark for how well versed in my skill set am I? Yeah, hundred percent. I think even we've been trying more on the marketing front to even just present the objections up front on the website because I know they're thinking about it. Yeah. So like, why not have a video of one of our customers saying, you know, I yeah, I thought it was too expensive or I didn't have budget or here's why it saved me X Y Z. So I think that's important. And then just you know, we have a few minutes left. We talked about sales. What I think really interesting too is your your background in that transition as well, because there's in tech across the board, there's a lot of movement right now. Yeah. 2023 was a weird year sure. honestly, for, for most of us. So I'm curious as someone who, you know, came up, like you said, you did the MBA, you went to the corporate world for a long time. Now as a franchisor, very hands-on building the business, of course. I don't really have a question here, more just like, what was that like? And yeah. yeah right. What are the, the pros and cons of it that you felt? Yep. So if anybody's listening and wondering, should they make the jump into entrepreneurship and, 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 you know, leave a, a salary and, and health benefits and all that, I am the walking billboard for that movement. I was mm-hmm. in corporate America for 25 years. I started as a sales representative and eight moves, 14 years later had become uh, a president and then later a chief operating officer. So, you know, when I was 22, I pointed at the top of the pyramid and I said, you know, that's, I want one of those jobs and I'll do whatever it takes to get there and did and then got there and realized this is not very fulfilling it's not making me very happy yeah. in fact it was making me miserable and my it, it, i made a very handsome salary very handsome yearly bonuses stock options the whole thing and walked away from that literally dropped the mic on corporate america now i didn't do it irresponsibly and i think it gets romanticized of you know you walk in and tell your boss to go shove it and although i was the boss so i really couldn't do you know but yeah no man i i had done tons of research, due diligence when I got into the first business, which is a, a, a boutique fitness business, boxing for fitness business, you know, had done marketing surveys, actually went in and surveyed members of the guy I was going to partner with to expand and franchise his concept. 
I, I can't tell you how detailed, how many, how many performers I had, how many spreadsheets with 50 yeah. tabs, you know, before I said, okay, I'm going to do it. But I will say Dustin that at, you know, at one point you just have to say, all right, I'm going to jump. And you know, on a Friday you, you finish your, you know, I had a succession plan, all that. And I, I finished my, my active role there. And on Monday I woke up with no salary, no yeah. health benefits, yeah. you know, no, and it was scary as hell. And by Tuesday, I was like, okay, this is still a little freaky. By Wednesday, I'm like, I'll never look back. I'll never look back. Mm. I work harder now than I've ever worked. This there's more pressure. You know, I have personal guarantees, all kinds of stuff you just don't have in the in the corporate world. But I love it. I absolutely love it. And now I love helping and coaching younger, you know, executives and team members uh, and try to give them the environment that I didn't have in corporate America where they get to try a lot of different hats. I think you said you were, you'd gone to a startup out of school and you know, mm-hmm. 20 people. And that's the best experience you can get because you do it all. You're not put in a, in a box and say, yeah, just, this is all you do. Don't ask any questions. Just do this. You know, in a smaller company, we have 27 people. It, I have 25, 26 year old employees that have done more in the three or four years out of school with us than people will in 40 years in, in corporate America because of, of what they can, we, we can enable and entrust them to do. So my, my journey was just one of, it didn't matter how much money I made, how successful, what it was always there, you know, what's the next thing on the ladder or rung on the ladder. And wow, I got to those top rungs and found myself hating going to work, which is no way to live, just no way to live. Yeah. And so I knew I had to make a change. And it's funny because I still see some of my colleagues now and they'll, they'll hop I mean, sometimes you get laid off, but they'll, they'll hop companies because I know they're thinking, well, I like this industry, but this company is just not for me. It'll be the next one. And it's always rinse and repeat. It always is. Every so often you may find a unicorn, but it's, it's pretty rinse and repeat. I I found that with my career. I left one and then I, I get a promotion and more money, but oh my God, this is the same stuff, different company, different day. And, and that's where I wanted to, my legacy for, you know, until I decided I don't want to do this anymore. And it is funny because when you're working for corporate America, I found when I worked for corporate America, it was, I was working towards an end goal an mm-hmm. exit, a get out, I'm done. And I, then I have freedom when you, at least for me, my experience has been when I became an entrepreneur, the finish line evaporated. It just dissipated from my, my eyes. And now it's about the game. It's just the game yeah. of business and playing the game and loving the game. And it's hard as hell. I'm not going to lie to anybody listening. If you think entrepreneurship is the rented Lambos and the BS jet photos you see on Instagram, that is not 99% of that is BS. Like, cause I, I, yeah. I have business partners that are worth $50 million and they don't fly private. Cause it's, you know, it's just ridiculously expensive. So they could afford to, but, but when you get that kind of money, you don't spend it on dumb stuff, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I, and I've flown private. It's wonderful, but it's just crazy expensive. And, and so my, my point is entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship is incredibly hard. So as hard as you think it's going to be, it's 10 times as hard, but as rewarding as you think it's going to be from a personal and personal development standpoint and growth, it's a hundred times better than you think it's going to be, but no, it's going to be 10 times harder than you think it's going to be also. So you have to have to be prepared for that math. Yeah. I think that's a realistic and not romanticized view of it, which is nice because we, we do see that a lot. A lot of people, you know, in, uh, B2B tech, for example, there's been a ton of layoffs. Everyone's seen it on the news, right? There's this yeah. solopreneurship movement and everything is painted as like rosy on your own. Everything's great. But when you actually talk to the people, some of them are killing it, but everyone's struggling. Like it's not, it's not easy, but universally they're all happy or even maybe they drop from 200K salary to 80K a year on their own business that they're growing. Yep. But universally yep. it's almost happier, right? A hundred percent. And what's great is if they're at 80 K, then it is their job and their responsibility to figure out how to get it to 500 K or a million yeah, and, exactly. and surpass what they were making. But the difference is nobody's going to be over your shoulder telling you what to do or how to do it or, you know, strategize like that is the difference is yeah. you wake up every day and go, if I don't kill, I don't eat today. My family <laughs> does not eat today. Yeah. That, that's about as much motivation as you can get. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> Hunger pains cool. will really drive your your <laughs> your outbound cold calls for sure. Exactly. Awesome, yeah. Roger. Well, I appreciate that. I know you have a book coming out actually on that topic we just talked about. So yeah. if you want to, you know, read that, learn about it, where should they go? 
Yeah, yeah. So it'll be available on Amazon, both, you know, physical book and on Kindle. It's called An Insider's Guide to Business Secrets from an Entrepreneur's Playbook. I've tried to capture the the real meat and potatoes of entrepreneurship. And I've also used some corporate examples, but it really is, it's the foundational things you need to be successful in business, not a 500 page book written by McKinsey consultants who have never run a business, they, but they've <laughs> studied them, which is, you know, I get it, but they haven't run, they haven't been in the trenches. They haven't signed their own name to a $3 million lease. They've never done that, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I've written a book from a guy who's not only done it, but I'm actually doing it. I'm still doing it. And and I hope that this book helps people. It, it, it allevi alleviates some of the the, the fear around entrepreneurship, uh, mm -hmm. gives them a guide that they can go back and use again and again, or they may read it and go, this sounds like it's harder than hell. I don't think I want to be an entrepreneur. That's fine too, right? Like I hope yeah. this book just has a binary reaction of, okay, I've got a guidebook, a real guidebook now, or damn, this is just too much work. <laughs> I don't want to do it. You know, that's, <laughs> that's a win for me either way. Yeah. If I've, yeah, if I've helped somebody. It'll be available on a, Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Getting a yes or a quick no. Same as sales, exactly, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Either it one works. Sales. Cool. And if people want to learn more about Thrive Brands, you know, look into franchising. Yeah. What should they do? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you for asking. They can check us out at our, our website for like our overarching umbrella company, which is called Thrive More Brands. And that's just thrivemorebrands.com. I have, they can connect with me on social at Real Roger Martin, R O G E R M A R T I N. And I, like you, have a podcast that I love to talk about business, health, wealth. That's called Thrive More with Roger Martin. So the website, follow me on the socials or check out the podcast. Awesome. So we'll include those links for our listeners. And Roger, Thank thanks you. again. That was a fun one. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Dustin. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode. My key takeaway is just that emphasis on strategic pauses when it comes to tonality. So maybe this is just me, but when I hear tonality, I think about the actual tone and speed of the speech. But I've kind of neglected the value of having those intentional pauses and where to actually place them. So just remember, no one trusts the fast talking sales guy. So slow down, talk to your customers as if they're actually people because they are, and it'll go a lot further. So thanks again for listening, and I'll be back next week with a new episode.